one trillion dollar deficit that we're close to running. He's a little shy of that this year. It kind of misses the boat. What was the boat it was missing that, that I was playing? This is my opinion, by the way. Where the money, what the money spent on, right? So where is G going? So in our our uh, our account of the of the nation here, government saving is equal to T minus G. And the T is total tax collections for a given year. And G is total government outlays. What they're spending their money on. If G is bigger than T, we run a deficit. And what happens to the debt? If we run a deficit, what happens to the national debt that year? It goes up. So now, way back when, we talked about stock variables and flow variables. Which one's the stock variable? Debt or deficit? Which one's the stock variable? Now let's back up our minds again. What was, how did we define a stock variable? How did it have value? versus a flow variable. If I told you I make $110,000, am I rich or poor? It depends on the time, the amount of time that I did the $110,000. Was it over a year or over 10 years? Is that a flow variable or a stock variable, income? Who wants to be brave here? It's okay to be wrong. That's the secret. Remember, I give extra credit points sometimes for, for wrong answers. So intuitively. it's a flow, right? It's a flow. And intuitively, it's right. It's a flow. So that's why I like to give you the, uh, my uh, bucket theory here. Of the stock is the level of the bucket, and the spigot <coughs> is the flow. So we have savings. We got savings coming in to our debt. Now this is kind of a weird bucket because debt, we owe money. And so it's really deficits, I guess we can phrase it that way. So we create a deficit and that's gonna raise the bucket level. <clears throat> if we pay off debt, then there'd be a leak in the bucket and it would go down. So debt has value at a point in time. So like right now we can go to the internet and there's lots of national debt calculators and you can see the little numbers spinning. Maybe how many of you have seen something like that before? National debt. So it's like running up a little ticker. And so we can look at what it is right now. 19 trillion means that we owe 19 trillion dollars to various places. We learned that there's other places that maybe it's not as big a deal. If the Federal Reserve or U.S. citizens own some of that debt, well, maybe that's a little different than China owning it or whatever. So we can, we can have those discussions, but the stock and flow concept remains. The deficit is the flow variable. The debt is the stock. And so that's the connection between debt and deficit. So that was the, one of the main things I was trying to drive home on Monday was the relationship between the two. And then we actually looked at the guts of it, which we had never done before personal income tax, social security tax, purchases of weapons of mass destruction, debt interest. You know, what are we spending our money on? And then of course there's further breakdowns of that. How much are we spending towards education? How much are we, so in this class we don't get into those breakdowns. In fact, I don't have um, any of my upper division economics classes where we really get down into the breakdowns because you're almost starting to get into just a, a more narrow area, which is fine, but not something I cover directly. But you can, it's all public information. You can go up and look, how much did we spend on education? How much did we spend on farm subsidies? How much did we spend on foreign aid? Right, all the accounts, it's uh, transparent to the public, usually after the fact. We don't know what else changing in between, but eventually the books are revealed to us so we know where our, our tax dollars went. <clears throat> okay, so any questions there so far? Yeah. I actually did have a question about one of your questions. 
It said most economists would not be in favor of a balanced federal budget, budget mandate, and I didn't really understand why. Okay, so uh, we'll talk more about that. So let me just make a few comments with that we're actually going to look at that a lot closer here in a little bit. Okay. Um, so a balanced budget mandate would mean that T must equal G every year, period. And so that would be a balanced budget of, um, requirement. And most economists are against that because we don't have any problems really with deficit and surpluses if they're being used in the right way. And that's where we'll put more meat on the bones later, where we're going to develop a quick little model to show what we mean by that. Um, in the United States, most economists probably do have problems with persistent deficits, deficits that have been going on for 30, 40 years. That's where the rub will be. Don't really care as much about the deficit itself, but what are we spending our money on and is it a persistent deficit? Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, so um, today what I want to start off on, on our plate of spaghetti here, is looking at the impacts of taxes, especially in the resource market. So when we have taxes that are being uh, coming off of our income, the flow that's not being shown here that I'm kind of doing magically here is uh, land, labor, and capital going to businesses, right? So that's essentially a tax on resources um, versus a tax at the, at the cash register is what's going on here with T2. As we run to the store, they ring up the cash register and we pay, how much do we pay in cash? Approximately, it varies from place to place, but roughly 8.9%, call it 9% is kind of a good Google thumb. So we pay about 9% at the cash register um, anybody from Overland Park here? Overland Park, the Lake area? Yeah, have you looked at your cash register receipt? How much do you guys pay in some places? You might not even know this, but have you ever seen it higher than nine? Yeah, yeah it's definitely higher than nine. What, what have you seen, or do you remember what you saw? Or? 11, yeah, no, that's true. Anything higher than that? I, I looked at some data once and I was shocked that I think at some malls, yeah. it's as high as 13%. Yeah, if you go to the mall, you'll pay more than if you go across town to a different store. You'll pay 11 or 9 or whatever. Well, um, the uh, local taxes that kind of overlay the state taxes is what's going on there. So potentially uh, there's a sales tax. That's kind of the 8.9 or whatever, somewhere I can't remember what it is. And then local counties and cities have the chance to put little extras on top. And then what's really weird about the Overland Park stuff is that they've got it isolated down to the mall. And what happened is that the city gave some sort of tax credits. It was some sort of deal when the mall was built. Hey, we're going to bring in new stuff, and then we'll allow the, this little extra tax to be tacked onto it. And so um, that was I hadn't seen that in other places, not that I looked that closely, but uh, where it was isolated down to particular places. So yeah, that can, that can vary as well. So that's what I want to spend a little time on uh, for starters. And then uh, got uh, at least a video two lined up, an exercise. Gosh, we got so much awesome stuff to get to here. Uh, so let's look at, this will be the boring part, I think, here, but hopefully not too boring. Impact of tax in labor and loanable funds market. So we haven't did this before in this way. Um, let me do them one at a time. So let's start with labor, since that's the one that uh, we pay a lot of attention to. So go ahead and draw kind of your home base for the labor market, labor demand and labor supply. So remember, the supply of people is coming us from households, and the people who are demanding labor, that's the businesses, right? So the businesses want to buy labor hours from you. And without any taxes, it's kind of the way we portrayed it before.
four. There would be an equilibrium wage rate. Let's just say it's ten dollars, and we'd have L1 amount of hours being worked. So here we were measuring labor hours. <laughs> Okay, so if we implement a tax, are you guys getting $10 per hour? No, you're getting something less right after the tax. Now, one of the things that the general public doesn't understand very well, and you, you almost have to have had a principles of economics class, I think. I don't think many people even talk about this, is that Taxes are almost always, except for some unusual cases, taxes are shared between the buyer and the seller. Taxes are shared between the buyer and the seller. In other words, as, as I'll show here in a sec, if you get taxed uh, a buck on your labor, it sounds like you're paying the tax, right? So 10 minus 1, I'm getting 9. But it turns out because of the interaction between in the marketplace between buyers and sellers of labor, both the business and the person will end up sharing that tax to some degree. And that's the way taxes work for, for everything. So there's a there's a burden of tax that we spend more time on in microeconomics. Those of you who haven't had micro yet will develop that more there. Um, but for our purposes here, we can think about that tax creating a wedge between what the um, business is paying and what the uh, household is getting. So another way to think about it is that if the household has to pay a tax of a dollar, then effectively they would have to get a, a dollar more for every hour that they work, right? Does that make sense? If they were to be in the same position, if you will, right? They would need a dollar more if they're currently earning 10, they need 11. If they're currently earning, uh, I'll just pick this number, whatever this is. If they're currently earning, uh, what do we got here? So that's 10, that's, uh, that's 20, that's got to be $18, right? They need to have $19. At this low wage, they need a buck more to be made just as well off. And so what happens is that the effective supply of labor, the labor supply with the tax is shifted up by the amount of the tax. All right, well, that works out good if you were currently, let me just put a 40 on here, working 40 hours a week. If you were working 40 hours a week and you're like, oh, no big deal, government, yeah, I'll pay a tax, no problem. Bump up that extra dollar and I'll be okay. But is that price sustainable? What happens at this wage rate? Is that sustainable in the market? No, what does it create? Those are, especially those of you who have micro, I'm not worried about as much for you guys who have macro. I'm just trying to kind of draw you into the issue here. That you created a surplus of workers, a surplus of labor, which means there's more people working. In other words, if we try to pass the buck off to the business, they can't afford that extra dollar and maintain hours at 40. Labor's become more expensive. What to get back to our gut feeling? Labor becomes more expensive, I cut back on labor, right? It's just a natural thing, a reallocation of resources, possibly to more machines and less labor, or whatever the thing is, I need to cut back. And so the cutting back starts to occur, and where the new equilibrium is, is where the supply curve with the tax and the labor demand curve intersect right here. And so the wage that will come about after the tax, W2 is something higher. And let's just say, I'm gonna keep things easy here, is $10.50. Okay. 
So that's the new pay raise. But is are the people getting ten dollars and fifty cents? No, because they have to pay their income tax back to the government. So their after tax pay is a dollar less than that. So this vertical distance ends up being the amount of the tax and where it intersects the real labor supply curve tells you W3 which is at $9.50. So W2 here is the wage paid by the business, the wage paid by the employer. So that's the wage paid by the employer. But the wage paid by the, or received by the employee is $9.50. This is the wage received after tax by the employee. Possibly worse yet is this effect. Because when the wage went up to even just 1050, the quantity of labor being hired went down. So we have this quantity effect where labor falls to L2. Whatever that number is, I'm just making up some numbers, let's say 38. So the labor <coughs> being worked after the tax is here. And that's the split. So if we take this dollar pay raise, we can look at who's really paying the tax. Well, the top part, the 50 cents, is what the employer's paying, right? So let me put this top hash mark as the amount employer pays. The employer pays that part of the tax. The employee only gets $9.50. They used to be making $10 an hour, by the way. Now they're effectively taking home $9.50. So they're paying the bottom part. So that's the employee share of the tax. Together, if we add these two things together, this equals government tax revenue. That red area plus the green area, which is the area of this rectangle, equals government tax revenue. Using my numbers, it's $38, or if this is in thousands, maybe, or whatever, if we want to change just thousands. If that's 38,000 hours, the government's collecting $38,000, right? So that area represents big T. So in this case, from our example, T <coughs> equals little t times what we're going to call LT, the quantity after the tax, just put a little subscript T down there, and that's simply $1 times 38 equals $38 worth of tax revenue. Okay, questions on labor. You're a little foggy on it. We're going to work through loanable funds here in a sec, so we'll hopefully get that another shot at the tax. Thing. 
<laughs> All right. Good. There's quite a few moving pieces here. Okay. How about, let me, I think I'll do this one over here. A loadable funds market. It's similar. So the price of money, the price of borrowing, was the real interest rate, right? So that was our price of loanable funds, supply of loanable funds, demand for loanable funds. And then we have the interest rate that clears the market and a certain amount of funds being exchanged. Yes, thanks. Here's the attendance sheet. Set around. Who was the primary demander? Let me, let me back up a second. Remember, everybody borrows money, potentially. Households borrow money to buy houses and cars and consumer goods. Governments borrow money, we've learned. Free, right? Phone. Okay, why don't you clear your phones off your desk. Make sure that distraction's off. Make sure that's totally turned off. Bree just gave us a helpful reminder to not be, not be engaged on that. What's your last name again? With an A? All right. So, um, who is our primary? So we had governments, and then we had businesses. Businesses borrowing money for capital machines and buildings and building additions. Who is the primary demander that we focused in on? Who was the demander of loanable funds that we really kind of honed in on for the demand curve? Because all of them borrow. Was it businesses, government, or households? Households? I'm pausing for a good reason. <laughs> businesses. You guys focus in on households because that's where your brain's at. But it turns out households uh, supply those loanable funds more than they borrow. Lucky for us, for crying out loud. So remember, that's what's kind of cool about macroeconomics is that we've got all these people living on our island. Some of those people are little savers, and some of those people are little spenders. And it turns out the savers outweigh the spenders. In the grand scheme of things, the savers outweigh the spenders. You guys are pretty hung up on spending right now, taking out student loans and stuff, and it's like, oh, that, how could that be? But it turns out that we have more saving going on. So our primary source of saving comes from households. Overall, in the aggregate, and our primary borrower ends up being business. Then on our, on our midterm exam, we talked about the government's effect of that. If they don't run a balanced budget and they run a deficit, they have to borrow, and that caused what effect? What effect did that cause if, if the government runs a deficit and ends up having to uh, borrow some money, that can lead to higher interest rates, right? So if the government has to go out and uh, sell some of these babies because they didn't have enough T to cover their G, so they borrow, if they're the demand curve, that leads to some increase in the interest rates, right? They enter the market and they're driving up interest rates. They're one of the players in the market. And that caused what sort of effect on businesses? 
Who remembers the name? It was on your test. Somebody out there remembers. I got my extra credit pencil out. What was the effect? There was an effect on businesses when interest rates went up, they borrowed less. Crowding out. Good job, Rex. Crowding out. So they get crowded out of the private sector. So that's not what we're talking about here, although it's kind of a similar, similar idea. The effect that we're talking about in this chapter is a tax effect. If the government confiscates some of your, I use that word, of course, somewhat jokingly. If the government confiscates your savings interest, right? So you put your money into some new investment and you earned a 10% rate of return. You put in $10,000, you made a thousand bucks worth of interest, right? The government taxes, the way our current system set up, the government treats that as income and you pay income tax on that, on your interest income. Most of you don't have any interest income now at this stage in your life. There might be a few of you who do, with, especially with this. if you had some savings for college uh, that wasn't maybe protected in a, five, in a uh, five old 529 plan, college savings account plan, you might have been paying a little bit of interest income at some point, maybe after you withdrew it. The government taxes slashes confiscates your interest income. All right. Well, that's fine. That's what the law of land is. What's its impact in the market? Well, it's the same thing. So the tax drives a wedge <coughs> between what the business is paying. So the business pays this, the rate that the producers or the business is paying is this, let's call it RP. And the rate that's after tax is less. If you earned a thousand dollars worth of income, interest income, on your ten thousand dollar investment, and the tax rate is twenty percent, what was your after tax profit or interest income? Eight hundred dollars, right? So you made $1,000, government says, I want 20% of it. You cough up $200 on April 15th, you're left over with 800. That's what's going on here, is that I earned 10% interest, but you only got paid the household, let's call it the consumer, RC, the household got paid 8% because 2% went to Uncle Sam. So the vertical height here is a tax of the effectively 2%. Let's just call it the tax. I don't want to get, get you going too much on tax rates versus the amount. Okay, so same thing. Let me use the same color coding here with the red and the green. When the government taxed savings uh, interest, the businesses used to pay 9% for loans. Because of the tax and the economics behind it, interest rates rose, which is kind of like the crowding out effect, by the way, that's what I was saying. Interest rates rise to 10%. And LFT, the quantity of loanable funds being borrowed, dropped. And so the businesses are effectively paying that much of the savings income tax. And the households the grandma and grandpas out there that saved their hard-earned little pennies over the years, they're paying that much of the tax in aggregate again. Okay, questions on that? All 
Okay, so um, I alluded to last time uh, a economic theory on tax rates and tax collections. So how do tax rates, little t, and tax collections, total tax, if you will, big T that we've been talking about, how do tax rates and tax collections work? Okay, well, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about here. So there's a little story about an economist named Art Laffer who sat down with President Reagan. And apparently this took place at a bar. I don't know if that was with this council. There's kind of a story that this conversation that I'm about to show you took place at a bar. And on a bar napkin, they wrote what's now become called the Laffer Curve. And so what he did is he put big T here, tax collections, total tax collections, and little t here. And imagine that we've got, oh, you guys can pick any old spot over here. It's possible for the tax rate to be 100%. Popular would that policy be? Not so much, right? So uh, at a hundred percent tax rate on income, how much money do you think the government would collect? How much do you want to go to work if the tax rate's a hundred percent? Who's who's going? What's the purpose of working? Right. So at a hundred percent tax rate. Total tax collected would probably be zero. Maybe there'd be some crazy people that just want to serve the public good, but then they might as well not be on the books for their income because their income's going to go away anyway, right? So probably create a whole bunch of distortions. But the idea would be that tax collections would be zero or very close to zero at a hundred percent tax rate. So, what about if the tax rate was zero? How much taxes would the government collect? Zero. Zero tax rate, zero taxes collected. So that's another endpoint. All right, so as we start to raise taxes, what happens to tax collections? They go down or up? As we start from zero. Go up. They'd go up, right? So if we go to a 10% tax rate, I don't know, where, where is that one? 10%? I don't know, maybe here, whatever. We start to collect some tax revenues, right? So this is the tax rate at 10%. Or at a tax rate of 10%, this is the total tax collected using this formula. Oh, and I erased it already. I mean, the T, the T, times, uh, T times the amount of income equals big T. All right, but is that always going to be upward sloping? So in other words, here's zero where you guys agreed that it's probably that. Does this line look like this? And then it goes straight down. Is that reasonable given human behavior? Probably not, right? So what, what do you think is more reasonable the way this thing looks? Some sort of graph like this, right? Some sort of curve to it. And so that was what has now become called the Laffer curve. And so the Laffer curve kind of goes up somewhere and then goes down. And I'm not even, I don't even want to put it there. Let me, I should show you where we're at today. So let me, this tax rate here. This tax rate 
let's call it T max. I'm calling it max because it's the tax rate that maximizes tax collections. So we got big T max and little T max. Somewhere in there, I don't know where it is, but somewhere in there it exists in theory. And that's what makes this kind of a theoretical model. So, should we, if our objective is to raise taxes, should we increase tax rates or decrease them? It depends where you're sitting. You guys got it, right? It depends where you sit on the Laffer curve. Should we increase taxes or decrease taxes? If we're on this side of the Laffer curve, so if we're at a, if we're currently at tax rates greater than T max, then a cut in the tax rate would cause tax revenues to climb. If we're at this point on the Laffer curve, then a raise, raising tax rates would cause tax revenues to climb. So the real question is, what side of the Laffer curve are we on? All right, so let's, uh, let's kind of write some of that down. So note, let's call this uh, T1. At T1, which is greater than T max, the policy instrument, if we were looking to raise taxes, then you should decrease T to increase big T. So at T1, if we're currently at T1, if the economy's at T1, the policy, if you were looking to raise taxes, would be to actually cut taxes, cut the tax rate. I should be more, a little more specific with my language. At T2, we should do the opposite. At T2, which is less than T max, little T max, we want to increase taxes to increase tax collections. So, the age-old question of should we raise taxes or lower taxes is better couched here in what side of the Laffer curve are we on? So, should we increase or decrease taxes, question mark? What does Trump think we should do? Decrease. I mean, it isn't exactly obvious that it's across the board. I think that's, that's the way... He's, he hasn't mentioned any increases on taxes on the rich, uh, but certainly I just heard in his uh, address last night, decreasing corporate income taxes and decreasing middle income taxes is what he phrased. So, all right, so should we increase or decrease the tax rate? The answer depends on what side of the Laffer curve, L-A-F-F-E-R, what side of the Laffer curve we are on. Laffer's argument to President Reagan, Laffer's argument to President Reagan was that we were on this side of the Laffer curve. And so Reagan went through some of the largest tax overhauls in the 80s of reducing tax rates. Now, at that point in time, tax rates were up there. What is the highest tax rate? I think we maybe have talked about this. It was actually in that video a little bit. What's the highest tax rate we've ever had in the United States? What do you guys think it was? What's your gut feeling? I'm not looking for the right answer. I want your gut answer. 20-something, so 20-something, the highest tax rate in the United States, God bless America, 30, 40, 40, 45, do I hear 50, do I hear 50? <laughs> the lots there, right? 30, 50, okay, we 
got a 50. All right, so imagine that if, if it's 50, that sounds pretty crazy, right? You made $100, $50 of it goes off to the government for them to decide how to spend your money in the right place. Well, it turns out the answer is actually 74%. 74%. True story. United States of America. What year? In the 70s. And it was on that uh, that that one fast-talking guy, so it wasn't up there very long, had the marginal tax rates up there. Now, I'll get into a talk about what that means. It does not mean, by the way, if you made $100,000, you paid 74% on, you didn't pay $74,000. Okay, so I'll give a discussion a little bit about the difference between marginal tax rates. But what it does mean, in fact, I think the equivalent would have been, let's say, let's say you were making $400,000, the next 100,000 that you made, so if you were going from 400,000 to 500,000, that extra 100,000 would have been taken away at 74%. You would have paid $74,000 on that. That was, that was kind of the structure of it. So even for the rich person, if you want to say, they don't need that money anyway or whatever, if that's kind of your gut feeling, it still for sure doesn't give much incentive for that person to work more, right? That same feeling you guys had when we said, if tax rates were really high, what sort of incentive would you have to work? It's the same thing for them, even though maybe they have plenty of money to live very comfortably, they're rich by pretty much all measures that we can imagine, it still doesn't give them incentive to more once they get up to that rate. So that would be argument being made here, is that if we can keep that person with incentives to work, then we'll be in a better spot. So Reagan took those, those top brackets down to that 30% level. And right now, uh, both Bush and, I mean, this, so this one would cross party lines is, what I'm, is where I'm going with this. Uh, Obama did not do any raises during his time, which would have been you know, kind of a, a normal, somewhat democratic answer, but because of the recession, tax rates remain. So 39.5 is the highest federal tax bracket right now, I believe. So 39%, so almost 40%. And again, that's for fairly wealthy individuals. So you're that $400,000, $500,000 income earner. You earn another hundred, you're gonna pay 40,000 in taxes. Eh, well, I got a lot of money. It's still more money. They're, they're at least not taking 50% or whatever. Thirty would be. That's where we're at today. So there's certainly a, a fairly hot debate among economists on whether tax rates should be increased or decreased because this thing is kind of a generic picture that would need to be analyzed for possibly each income bracket. Is it too high for some brackets and not for others? Um, and then on the corporate side. So where does, where does this end up going up? Because in a sense, here's the one key thing you need to pull away from this. If I decrease the tax rate, where is the extra money coming from? That almost doesn't make sense, does it? If I decrease the, gosh, are you blowing a bunch of economic smoke up my rear end or what? If I decrease the tax rate, tax collections go up? What, where's the math in that? Well, that's what I'm asking you. Where is the math in that? What's going on that creates more tax collections? More people working, right? More income because now the incentive to work is higher. So we have a quantity effect that most people don't take into account. You guys as Principles of economics students now just had a pretty big dose of something that most people don't know is that there's going to be this potential quantity effect. That quantity effect's right here. That quantity effect is right here. So if we have the tax rate reduced, this vertical distance gets a little bit smaller, right? And so when it gets a little bit smaller, if I have a tax rate change, let me get the uh, color something here, I guess green. If I reduce the taxes and I cut them in half, this vertical is half the distance of that. I cut the taxes in half, 
well, or the tax, I should say the tax rate, the tax amount per unit, we end up having more people going to work. And so if that quantity effect is big enough, then that causes this to happen. We put more people to work, and there's more income to tax in the first place, right? All right, so let me add on to that. Depends on where we're at on the Laffer curve. Let me, I'll get rid of this one. Okay, so how does, how does T increase when little t decreases? Good question. Well, let's go back to our formula. Big T is actually equal to little t times 1. Real GDP, our income. So this is our income. This is, again, our tax rate. And this is the total tax. And so how T goes up is that if this goes down, this goes up. So the key here is that lower tax rates cause income to increase because more resources go to People save more, so I said resources, and we were kind of focusing in on labor, but in general, the, the incentive to save is higher, too. And when people save more, it enters our banking system, and it turns into a tractor, right? So we end up getting this transformation of putting resources to work. Stuff gets changed into tractors instead of Twinkies. If we increase our savings, we're decreasing our consumption. So there's those trade-offs there. All right, so I mentioned that napkin story. You might have saw me bring this in. Here's that napkin. Here's the napkin. So this guy right here, the little guy, I guess he's pretty little too, but this is Art Lapper. This is that economist. This is Wayne Angel. So the Angel Snyder School of Business, this is Wayne. He's the one that created my position here. So he was the former Fed governor. Um, in those days, this is Janet Yellen. This is Paul Volcker. He was the chair of the Federal Reserve when Wayne was the, on the seven-member board. So we've got two of the seven here in this picture. Laffer served on Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors back in the 80s. And then this is Terry Haynes, our university provost. This is me. This was at a thing that we did in New York uh, honoring Wayne Angel. And that was kind of a big event. And so this, uh, i got to back up to tell the napkin here. So I had heard this napkin story forever. Right? And um, been telling it forever in principal's class, just like I told you guys. So then Art Laffer was going to be at this thing. I'm like, oh man, I got to do something. So I drug this frame to New York and I had a kind of a high quality paper napkin that I was going to see if he'd sign just, just to get a signature on it or something. Not knowing what he was going to be like. Well, it turns out he's a total jokester and comical guy. And so I come up to him and I said, um, you know, would you, could I get your uh, signature on this napkin? I kind of explained what I wanted to do for, for students and showed them the frame. And he's like, oh, come with me, come with me. And so he took me to the corner of the table and he pulls out one of the big stacks of nice cloth linen napkins, grabs one, pulls the marker out, and then he wrote this and it says, to Russ McCullough, this is the only curve I'll ever throw you. Our last. And so he kind of took the, it's easier to ask for uh, forgiveness than permission. And he, so this is a napkin from the hotel we were in. So you guys can kind of pass that around, take a peek. 
All right, so you guys ready for a video? Let's do a little video here. We've had enough. Enough chat talk.
I don't think he was real clear. Um, he might have been crystal clear, but he talks about it fast. So how do you get a capital gain? So if you had some accounting class, you might be in it now. What was he saying? How you actually owe the government money because what did you do? You bought some yeah. Yes. Right, which is kind of like savings, right? Or, and I put here investment long term. So if you um, buy a rental property for 100000 and you sell it for 110000 you made $10,000 worth of profit. If you held that property at least one year, then you'll be subject to the capital gains tax. So the government has different tax rates for different things, and that is one that he has. So a lot of Trump's money falls into this capital gains thing. And people who are involved in real estate have a lot of capital gains income, and so then they're subject to the capital gains tax. Whereas us ordinary people have mostly ordinary income. I went to my job, I made $50,000, and I have to figure out the income tax that I owe. All right, and then finally, there can be some inheritance tax when you get, uh, when your um, loved one dies and leaves you 100,000 bucks, hopefully you'll be in that position at some point, you might owe some money as the bottom line. And actually, the money gets paid before distributed to you, so you're like, oh, no big deal, I never knew that it was my tax anyway. So it's really the dead person's tax is how it ends up working. So there's lots of different ways that taxes are applied. And the one that is that I want you to pay the most attention to, which now I lost my video. I meant to try to pause that video. I'm going to watch the whole thing again. Get the marginal tax rate. So I'm going to put that chart back on. Good morning, John. Welcome to the special edition of the area. Right. This guy might have to make it. Pause. Okay, so this is the one you should pay special attention to. This is in your book. You need to know this for the test coming up. What is this person paying in terms of tax? What is their average tax rate? He didn't say it in the video, so I'm actually asking you to calculate this. But I don't want you to necessarily pull out your calculators. Let's just talk about how it's calculated. So everybody's clear on the person making 10000 That's the one we all know, right? My tax rate is 10%. I made $10,000. How much am I kicking out to the government? 1000 bucks. All right. So now, what about the $50,000 person? How do we calculate their T, big T? So total tax paid big T, I was to write out an equation, how would I calculate it for this $50,000 income earner? 50,000 times what? 0 0.15, no. And that's the, that's the key part that I want you to understand that's, that most people, again, don't get. The first 17,000 gets taxed at 10%. So 17,000 of my income gets taxed at 10%. Plus, how much? 33, good. We've got to do a little math in our heads there. 33,000 of my money gets taxed at? 15%. Okay? That is how the real tax system works. This is what it means to be bumped into the next tax bracket. When I told you about the person who got bumped into the 74% bracket, that was somebody down here, the 500,000. Now that top bracket is 39 or 30, it was 35 at this time. It got raised to 39, I think. Um, so those high income earners, each time, that's how you calculate big T. You put the little t, which is the marginal tax rate, applicable to each unit of income, each bracket. So this is called the marginal tax rate, which is a word you need to know. Marginal tax rate. Because it's your marginal income that's going to be hit with it. The next... X amount between 17 and 70 
gets taxed at the 15% marginal rate. Okay, so questions on that? Let's see if we can pull this off without calculators. 17,000 times 10% is? 1,700, got that one. 33,000 times 15%? Let's see, 10% would be what? What's 10%? $3,300, what's half of that? This one I did pick kind of a tough one. 15, 1,000 what? 1,650, add those two together, five, nine, uh, $4,950. 1,700 plus 4,950, this one I, I'll just cheat this way here, five, nine, seven, 16, $6,650. That is the tax, big T, that was paid by the person who owned, earned $50,000. Cool? Now, what is the average tax rate? On average, what is this person making $50,000 paying? How would we calculate it again? This is big T. Big T equals 66.50. My income, big Y for macro class here, my income was $50,000. How could I calculate the average tax rate I paid? What kind of division would I need to do? 50 divided by... 50 divided by... So which number is 50? T divided by Y, right. Good. So if I take 6,000, let me draw this over here because I'm going to keep the screen down for our next thing. Well, actually, let me just throw it up here. So the average tax rate, not the marginal rate, but the average tax rate equals T over Y which in this case would be 6,650 divided by my $50,000. And now somebody with a calculator, go ahead, what'd you get? 13.3? 13.3%. Make sense? Does it make sense that it'd be somewhere between 10 and 15? Yeah, right? we're just kind of averaging out the two. Yes? For a married couple, how different would it be for like the individual? Um, the, the tax uh, brackets would remain the same. Okay. The marriage marriage preference comes in with the uh, calculating your taxable income. So if you're married, and they've changed some of these laws. Well, that's part of the reason gay marriage got approved, or that was one of the arguments for gay marriage, is that there was tax rates for married people to some degree. They weren't always huge, but there's that was one of the things. And so it allowed you to deduct or to, to use the tax code for a married couple. And the brackets would be the same, you'd just be summing their income together. Percentage is the same, like the amount that makes the difference for a married or single, right? Right. So you you'd have uh um, like for the single would be like zero to like ten thousand, right? Um oh the actual bracket? Yeah. yeah, as far as the calculation they would do it, but it it equalizes out to be the same. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it ends up being pretty much a fair shape whether you're individual. So they tried to keep away from, uh, there's other, I don't want to get into a complicated tax talk. No, I'm, for one thing, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, there's one big reason, but married file jointly or filing individual. It was possible for you as a married couple to file individually if for some reason that was better for you, but it gets into the reasons it would be would be complicated tax codes. And so they pretty much equalized that so that we didn't have people filing individual returns that were really married or whatever. So they're, they're basically treated as equal, okay? Long story short. All right, any other questions on tax rates? Marginal tax rate, average tax rate, super important. Um, the, the, one of the reasons that this motivates me to tell you guys this is that when I was your age or younger, for some of you, I worked in a restaurant and one of my 
uh, buddies that I got to know was was Mike Smith. He was our manager, and uh, one day Mike was uh, they were asking for overtime hours, and Mike was like, "Oh, dude, I can't I can't put in overtime. It keeps me in a higher tax bracket. And my paycheck goes down." And you know, I was a I was a business student at a community college at the time, so I wasn't heavy into econ. But I'm like, there's no freaking way that you pay more taxes uh, just before. It's like, dude, I've done it before, man. I, I put in the extra hours, and my paycheck actually goes down compared to when I worked less hours. So, what was Mike misunderstanding? What did what bracket did it possibly jump him into, or what? What do you think was causing? So Mike was telling the truth, by the way. His paycheck was less. His, his actual amount on his check was less. But what are some reasons why that could be bumped him up? It, it might have bumped him into a higher bracket, but that wasn't that he wasn't actually making less money. His after-tax income on his paycheck went down a little. What what goes on with your paychecks? Taxes, is that the amount you for sure owe that day that you worked? What what do we do? What's our process in the United States? What is that called? You guys are settling up. Some of you are doing your taxes now for April 15th. What do you do? Each paycheck, it shows, oh, federal income tax. But is that your actual amount due, or what are we doing April 15th? There's deductions. What do we do April 15th? We have our returns, and what, have, what do our returns do? <coughs> Shows up if we, yeah, some of you get money back. What does that mean, that you got money back? Is that a tax credit? Is that some sort of welfare system because you're a poor college student and, and the government wants to help you out? No, what, what went on? You had too much taken away, withheld. So your withholdings were higher. So what Mike, what my buddy Mike was finding was that when he worked the extra hours, it bumped him up into a bracket that was a little bit higher on his withholdings, like a new category that took away some of his check. But he actually wasn't paying more tax, it was just more withholdings. And so at the end of the year, come April 15th, that's what you guys are doing with the government as you're settling up. The government uh, creates penalties for you if you were not timely out the year paying your taxes as you go through withholdings. In other words, you can't just say, I don't want any taxes uh, held up. I'll settle up with you next year. The government will let you do that, but you're going to face some penalties and fines for doing that. So you have to have withholding. So what we're doing on April 15th is settling up with the government our actual taxes due. During the year, you just had withholdings from your check. Okay? Questions on that? Make sense? A lot of moving parts here. We've got tax rates and tax and withholdings and escrows and all kinds of stuff. All right, let's see if we can find another another video. This one deals a little bit with rich poor. Have you guys studied income inequality in some of your classes, or has that been a topic of discussion? This video kind of talks about rich versus poor with tax rates. One often heard contemporary economic myth is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Like any myth, there is a nugget of truth to this. For example, if we look at the thing, the top 20% of earners today do have a larger share of national income than they did in the past, and the bottom 20% of income earners do have a smaller share of national income than they had in the past. There's two problems with that data. First of all, that data doesn't tell us anything about the absolute condition of the poor. Just because one has a smaller share of, the, of income doesn't mean that one is absolutely poor. So for example, it could be the case that even though poor Americans have a smaller share of national income, their absolute income is higher. If I asked you, would you rather have a sixth of a pizza or a ninth of a pizza, your answer might depend on how big the pizza is. And having one ninth of a pizza might be better if the pizza was much larger than the one in which you would have one sixth. The real income of the poor Americans today is higher than it used to be, even though their share of total income is somewhat lower. But all of this misses the more fundamental point. The bigger problem is that data is snapshot data that compares wealthy people in one year with wealthy people in the years before, poor people in one year, poor people in years before. What it doesn't take into account 
is the movement in individual households through time. If we can track individual households, we might be able to know what happens to poor people in, say, five years or 10 years or 15 years. And in fact, we do have that data. One set of data shows that between 1979 and 1988, 86% of households that were poor in 1979 were no longer poor in 1988. A second set of data from the University of Michigan shows that of households that were poor in 1975, over 95% of them were no longer poor by 1991. One of the most important things to understand when we talk about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer is this idea of income mobility. The reality is for most Americans that they start off poor and then they slowly become richer over time. And in fact, if we look at that data comparing 1975 and 1991, what we find is that the average income gain for rich households over that period was just about $4,000, but the average gain for poor households over that period, $28,000. So what really happened between 1975 and 1991 is that the rich got richer, but the poor got richer a lot faster than the rich did. So whenever we talk about rich and poor, we have to take account of this issue of income mobility. So how can it be that most Americans are getting richer while well, we know that there's still plenty of poor people out there? Well, the fact is that one of the things that happens over time is who comprises the income distribution of changes. Immigrants, young people entering the labor force come into that income distribution at low levels of income. They become the poor while the old poor slowly move their way up. So even though at first glance the data may make it seem like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, the reality of the United States in the early 21st century is that everybody's getting richer, rich and poor alike. And the idea that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer is largely a statistical artifact and most of them. Yeah. Okay, reactions to that one. So, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. Does it seem like the rich are doing it at the expense of the poor? Does it appear that way? Do some of the arguments that the, uh, that the media makes when they talk about um, income inequality that if the rich get richer, it must be at the expense of somebody else? that the poor are getting poor. So that is kind of the way that this data sometimes portrayed, that if the rich are getting richer, somebody must have paid the way. And that is usually the poor. When income inequality is increasing, so the gap between the rich and the poor tends to be the focus. So the gap. So income inequality focuses in on the gap of rich and poor income. That gap has been increasing in the United States. So we have seen that gap widen. So what does that mean? If we're measuring over time the income of the rich and the income of the poor, at some point in time, if this is the income of the rich and this is the income of the poor inequality is this gap at a point in time so if this is 2000, I don't know, 2010, just to pick a number out, we can analyze the distance, if you will, in income between the average top 20% and the bottom 20%. That's what gets portrayed in the media 
is this gap. And that's what income inequality is, is measuring. And so some people argue that we are in a worse position because that gap is bigger now in 2016. But in what way is that a little bit misleading? According to this picture that's just me scribbling on the board, if, if that reflects reality, what would be misleading about focusing in on the gap? The poor are getting richer too, right? So if our focus is on getting people more money, it looks to me like we've had a win-win situation. Both the rich have gotten richer, but the poor have gotten richer, right? Even though the gap has gotten bigger, should we be concerned about the gap? I argue no. Some people do. They say, well, there's not. So if you're concerned about the gap, what is the answer? So let's just, let's just take for uh, granted that the gap is important to us as a society because we don't want, you know, there being too big of a gap, whatever our argument is. What is the answer to closing the gap? Tax the rich more. Tax the rich more and? Tax the poor less. And tax the poor less possibly, but tax the rich more and then do what with it? Give it to the poor, right? And that's going to bring up this bottom. So the whole take from the rich, give to the poor, these transfer payments that we've been missing in on, the redistribution of income tends to be what people do when they think this is the problem. All right, so let's, let's write some of that out before we get too ahead of ourselves here. So um, focus seems to be currently on the size of the gap. But if we're actually concerned about the poor, we kind of should be happy with this result if we focus in on the bottom. So, but if we focus on the poor, we see they are better off, despite the gap. So despite the bigger gap, the poor are better off. So if our policies are designed that way, Maybe it's not a problem to begin with. I'm not completely saying that it's not, to some degree, or that we shouldn't do some policies, but I'm trying to kind of walk you through contemporary discussions today on tax and transfer policy. Questions? Why did the gap become bigger? Um, so the gap might get bigger because they have more money to invest, and so they're going to continue to get richer too. I guess would be a long story short, right? Now, what are they investing in? They're investing in potentially new businesses that put some of these people to work. Potentially, right? So they're putting investments to work. They're buying businesses or doing uh, investments of some sort, which is leading to this going up as well, potentially. Okay? Yeah, question? You look at their um, income rates and stuff and compare it that way. Are they growing at the same rate? Uh, I don't. I don't have that exactly on on the rate of growth. Uh, certainly, some people argue again. Statistics don't lie. But anybody know the rest of that cliche? Statistics don't lie. But that's close. Liars use statistics. 
statistics don't lie, but lie are statistics. So depending on what data you gathered up and what it looks like, you can probably conjure up some data that's actually truthful with some assumptions that usually don't get published in the media. You know, the underlying, nobody digs down to the fine print and, well, let's see, they sourced, they, uh, they so, um, cited this source. Let me go double check that source and, you know, kind of get it down. So it's just the headline that we see, right? And so, um, yes, some people would say that this, this growth rate might be higher, but at other times it's not. Okay? Good question. Zach, did you have some? Uh, they got the video, you're saying the more we're getting richer at uh, faster rate, the richer we're getting richer. So yeah. Already be decreasing that gap? Yeah, I'm gonna, let me come back to that. That gets on this income mobility question, what they were touching in on the video. And I'm gonna circle back to that. So let me see if I get to the answer to your question. Yeah. Isn't this because that, like, there's a new, uh, like, more poor people coming in, like new workers? That's a part of it, and that's kind of this mobility issue too. That that's a possibility. And if if we have uh, refugees have been a, a hot topic, if we bring in new refugees to the United States, are they do they jump right into a high paying job? No, right. So they're immediately feeding into the bottom, which might start to drag down the average statistics also. So I mean, good point. There's all kinds of things that can be impacting the data that we that we cite. Okay, any other last questions or comments uh, so far? All right, so we see that they're better off despite the gap. So if our eye is on the poor, we might have been doing something fine. So <laughs> the, the uh, potentially harmful the potentially harmful answer with good intentions is to simply transfer transfer income from rich to poor through taxes. So the potentially harmful answer, when you look at the gap, if you think the gap is the problem, it's going to lead you to a bad answer because it's really maybe not the problem to begin with if we lost our focus off focusing on the rich. And so the argument that makes it really harmful is that if we tax the rich at 74% and give it to the poor, the gap starts to close in terms of after tax. But what happens next year? What happens to the rich? They don't work, right? Or they, they, the incentives to work and to invest and to do other things starts to diminish, which ultimately could cause the income for the poor to also fall. So this zero-sum mentality is really dangerous and really normal for most people to have. Zero-sum mentality. What I win, what I gain is what you lost. My gain equals your loss. That is how some people treat the economy and the market system. But when we started this whole course off, what did we learn about Tom and Jen on the island? It was actually, I guess that was in micro class, Japan and the United States. When they engaged in trade, who won and who lost? They both won. It's not a zero-sum game is the point. The economy is not a zero-sum game. The economy and the market system has potential to create two winners. That's what happened here. We have two winners, the rich one and the poor one. Not the gap. 
by focusing in on the gap, we might be tempted to do a transfer. That is a zero sum. I take a dollar from the rich, I give it to the poor. This year, that's a zero sum. But next year, there might be a couple things going on. I mentioned the rich might not want to work as much. So the higher tax rates or whatever might deter them from working. But what about the poor person who got the buck? What's their incentives like? Not work as much. I might lose my buck. So we've got kind of a double whammy going on, possibly more so, I would argue, on the poor side, is that if we continue to kind of give more assistance that's beyond relief, by the way, I'm totally into relief efforts that are somebody has to see, they're starving, they're hungry, whatever, but that same person who has learned that the system can be nursed into a job with their handout, we're probably not doing them any favors either, right? So the incentives to work by both the rich and the poor can be derailed to some degree if there's too much of this going on. I believe that some of this should go on, by the way. Okay, so I just put that cards on the table. I'm not trying to abandon this. I'm just saying we have to look at where we are at today. Have we done too much? Have we done too little? Where are we at on the Laffer curve kind of is the thing. There's a certain amount of transfer payments, but have we reached a point where if we lower some of that, we'll actually get higher benefits, uh, more benefits, or restructure them? What type of help are we giving? Are we re-educating, retraining with job skills and other things? Okay, so that is on kind of the gap. Does anybody have any, is that clear on the gap? Did I write it up here? And then I want to talk a little bit about income mobility. So your taxes, no, I need to, I need to answer this a little bit more. It's potentially harmful, harmful how? Less incentive for rich to work. That guy named Rich. Less incentive for rich to work, and also less incentive for the poor to work. So, don't look at the, don't look at income as a fixed pot, as a fixed piece of pizza pie, let's do pizza, this is a little more fun, as a fixed size pizza, small, medium, or large. In other words, if that's our income, our real GDP for the nation, we need to be careful about how we slice up the pie. If we don't like that the rich and the poor have varying shares, this is the rich, and this is the poor. If we don't like that, we might be tempted to say, well, let's make it nice and even, and we'll give this to the poor. Now it's 50-50. I get it. Take from these guys this amount, give it to these guys. That's the answer. We've solved income inequality. The government has the ultimate power to tax you at whatever rate you want. So they could set tax rates high enough to do precisely that. Would the world be a better place if it was 
50-50, rich and poor. Some people argue, yeah, maybe that would be better. If, if, if the gap was smaller, that's our approach we need to do. But the problem is that might cause the pie to shrink. If we have that, we might just cause the pie next year to shrink. So if this is the 2015 pie and we did that, possibly the 2016 pie, we're right back to that picture and we redistribute. And the rich's income has gone down, the poor's income has gone down. Even after the redistribution, this size of the pie is less than this size of the pie. And the pie starts to shrink. We have less and less pie. So the moral of the story is, if we want to all eat more, let's make more pie. There's the pie we want to get to. How do we get there? Well, that's easier said than done, but these transfer payments are likely not the way to do it when we start to take into account incentives of the agents, the economic agents, households, people, moms and dads, high school students, retirees, right? We need to think about their incentives. Incentives matter. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, let's go make more pie. We'll call it a day there. Mark your watches. This is a substantial deviation from the norm. So we got some more stuff to do on Friday. Um, so remind me on Friday to talk to the whole class about it. So we're going to talk about a, this fair tax system on Friday. <laughs> and then so we'll hit some of that on, what the, on the video. It's kind of a short video presentation of a subtopic. So basically, Friday is not showing work out yet. Yeah. yeah, just email me what section you want to do. Yeah.